Hello everybody and welcome to the third video in the genetics unit. Um, so in this video we're going to talk about two different topics. Um, the first topic is going to be the, a test, what's, what we call the test cross, and the second topic is going to be on the dye hybrid cross. So first let's start with the test cross. Um, so just like it sounds like, a test cross is a cross we do where we're testing to see what allele um, a given organism has. So for example, if we look at the ability to taste a chemical called PTC, um, if you have the dominant allele for this trait, if you have the capital T, that means you're able to taste this chemical. Um, so if you have a dominant dominant, you could taste it. If you have a dominant and recessive, you could taste it. But if you are recessive, if you have two little t's, you cannot taste PTC. So some of you in the class may be tasters of PTC, but you, if you're a taster, you don't know if you're um, homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So to figure out what we, you are, what we can do what's called a test cross. So if I took an individual who could taste PTC and I crossed them with someone who was, was homozygous recessive, if we looked at the offspring, um, we could figure out what their second allele is. So let's kind of think about this for a second. So I'm going to shrink this slide. So remember that we don't know if someone who is a taster it has a is homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So if I cross this mystery person with a homozygous recessive individual, if they were homozygous dominant, like in this situation over here, if I drew out my Punnett square, all of their offspring would be heterozygous. So in other words, all of the offspring would be tasters. Conversely, um, if my person was a heterozygote and we cross them to a homozygous recessive, Half of their offspring, oops, half of their offspring would be tasters. So half can taste, and half are non-tasters. So you can kind of see, but if, if you use this homozygous recessive in the cross, you could figure out what the original genotype of the parents were. So in other words, if you're homozygous for this trait, you would expect all of your progeny to be tasters. And if you were heterozygous, half your progeny would be tasters and half would not. So let's look at another example here. Um, so here, um, I in laboratory retrievers, um, if the dog has has the dominant allele, they're black, and if they're homozygous recessive, they're brown. So if you have a black dog here, you don't know if they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So if we cross this dog with the homozygous recessive, um, if they were homozygous dominant, the, the black dog would donate a capital B always, and the brown dog would donate a little b, so all of the offspring would be black. But if my black dog right here were heterozygous, it would donate a capital B half the time and a lowercase b half the time. And my brown dog would always donate a lowercase b, so you would get half black offspring and half chocolate labs. So you could see, using this test cross, by crossing to a homozygous receptive individual, you can figure out what that second allele is um, if you have the dominant phenotype. Um, so that was test crosses. So now we're going to move into a completely different topic, um, which is dye hybrid crosses. But before we can talk about dye hybrid crosses, I have to remind you a little bit about independent assortment, um, which we actually already saw in the meiosis unit. Um, and this is basically the idea um, that in meiosis, when we're forming sperm and eggs, um, when homologs line up on the metaphase plate in metaphase one of meiosis one, um, they can line up in different orientations. So if my parent 
was originally a heterozygote. So they're heterozygous for this S gene and heterozygous for this Y gene. Um, the chromosomes with the S gene represent one homologous pair and the chromosomes with the Y gene represent a homologous pair. And when they align, they could align with the dominant alleles on the same side and the recessive allele on the same side, or because chromosomes line up randomly, um, they could align with the dominant S with the recessive Y and the recessive S with the dominant Y. So there are two different ways um, the chromosomes could line up during metaphase. So therefore, um, if we did metaphase this way, we'd end up with two cells with two dominant alleles and two cells with two recessive alleles. And conversely, if we did metaphase one this way, at the end of meiosis, we'd have um, two cells that had a dominant and recessive allele and two cells with a dominant and recessive allele. So we say that the hom homologous pairs sort independently. The way they line up aren't dependent on one another. So this becomes really important if we're doing what's called a dihybrid cross, which is a cross where we're looking at two traits. Remember, in a monohybrid cross, it was a cross looking at just one trait. Okay, so now let, so let's look at an example. So first, um, again, a dihybrid cross is looking at two traits. So we're going to be looking at both um, this R gene and this Y gene. So if I start with two true breeding parents, so I have a true breeding parent who's um, capital R and capital Y, and a true breeding parent who's lowercase r and lowercase y, um, this parent here can only donate a capital R or a capital Y. So their gametes are always going to be big R, big Y. And this parent here can only donate a little r and a little y, so their gametes will always be little r, little y. So if you do this cross, 100% of the time, your offspring are going to be completely heterozygous. So now if we take this heterozygote to the offspring from the previous page, the big R, little r, big Y, little y, and if we follow it during meiosis, it's going to replicate its chromosomes, and then in metaphase, it could, either li it could line up in either one of these assortments. Um, if it lines up this way, um, we end up with the capital alleles together and the lowercase alleles together. And if it lines up this way, we end up with a capital allele with a lowercase allele and vice versa. So you can see I have made four distinct different gametes. I've made a gamete with two capital letters, one with two lowercase letters, one with a lowercase r and a capital Y, and one with a capital R and a lowercase y. So these are all the gametes that just this one plant could make. And if I crossed it to a different plant with the same genotype, um, the offspring, because remember that this was my F1, if I cross these two F1 plants together, my F2 offspring, their phenotypes are going to be in a really predictable ratio um, that's 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, that we'll talk about a little bit more later in the video. So let's look at another example. So he, in this example here, we're looking at two genes. We're looking at coat color in laboratory retrievers. Remember, black is dominant and brown is recessive. And we're also looking at blindness in labs. Um, so in this case, a capital N means that they have normal sight, and, a, and if you're recessive, that means you're blind. So we can look at this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio and actually get quite a bit of information out of it. Um, so you can see if a dog has the capital allele for both genes, so they have, they're black with normal vision, that's our biggest category. That's the 9 in our 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. That means out of 16 offspring, 9 of them are going to be dominant dominant if I, if I had originally crossed two heterozygotes. Three, so three sixteenths of my dogs will be dominant for one gene, so they'll be black, but they'll be recessive for the other, so in this case blind. Three sixteenths of my dogs 
will be recessive for the first gene and dominant for the second, so chocolate with normal vision. And then finally, one sixteenth of my dogs will be totally recessive, so chocolate and blind. Okay, so finally, um, let's actually do an opponent square and see how we get this 9 to 3 to, three, um, to 1 ratio. So first, um, we're going to start with two true breeding plants in my parental generation. Um, this plant can only d donate a capital T and a capital Y. This plant can only donate a lowercase t and a lowercase y. So that means if this is my P generation, my F1 generation is going to be all heterozygous. So all capital T, lowercase t, capital Y, lowercase y. Um, so if I if my original parent plants were tall with yellow seeds, and this plant was short with green seeds, all of my um, F1 plants are tall with yellow peas. I'm now going to take this plant, and I'm going to cross it with an, another plant from the F1 generation. So I'm going to cross two heterozygotes together. And we, we saw earlier in a dihybrid cross, if you cross two heterozygous, plants, you should always get a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Um, so let's think about what gametes each of these plants can make. Um, they could make, through independent assortment, capital T, capital Y. They could make capital T, lowercase y. They could make lowercase t, capital Y, and lowercase t, little y. So there are my four gametes, and my two plants are the same. So they could each make each of these gametes. So just like with my monohybrid cross Punnett squares, I take all of the possible gametes for one plant and I put them on one side of my square. And then I take the possible gametes for my second plant, which in this case are exactly the same, and put them on the other side of the square. And then I just fill in the square accordingly. So this box is going to have these two gametes. Um, this box here will have this gamete and this gamete, you know, it's the same kind of deal. Um, we do put the T's together and the Y's together, just for, um, so that's just the way we write it, just so you know. So if I fill out my square, it would look like this. Um, I, I, I did it quickly so we didn't waste time on the video um, writing it all in. And if I actually went through and calculated, this plant would be tall and yellow. This guy would also be tall and yellow. Tall and yellow tall and yellow, tall and yellow. This one's tall and green. This one's tall and yellow. That one's tall and green, tall and yellow, tall and yellow, short and yellow. Uh, this one's short and yellow, tall and yellow, tall and green short and yellow, and then finally I have one plant by itself that's short and green. So let's tally them up now. So if I first look at just tall and yellow, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I have nine of those. If I look at my tall and green, I have one, two, three, if I look at short and yellow, I have one, two, three. And if I look at short and green, just this one guy, I have one. So you can see my two dominant phenotypes have my biggest, my nine. One dominant and one recessive is three. One recessive and one dominant is three. And then finally, all by itself, my two recessive phenotypes, I only have one offspring. So this picture is showing a very similar example. We're not going to walk through the whole thing again. But just remember that this cross resulted if I have two heterozygotes being crossed together. I see this very predictable 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio on the offspring. That's 9 offspring with both dominant phenotypes. 3 with a dominant and recessive, 
three with a recessive and a dominant, and then finally one with two recessive traits.